as they interfere with the broadcasting system, even when switched to silent. No apologies have been received. We're moving on to our fifth evidence session of the Criminal Justice Bill at Stage 1. We have two panels of witnesses today. We'll be considering provisions on corroboration and related reforms. You've got to at last, committee. Uh, and we'll be hearing evidence from the Lord President and later from the Lord Advocate. So I welcome to our first panel, Right Honourable Lord Gill, Lord President of the Court of Session. Good morning. Roddy Flynn, Legal Secretary to the Lord President. And Elsie McIntyre, Deputy Legal Secretary to the Lord President. Also, good morning. And Lord President, I understand you wish to make a brief opening statement. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. I, I, I just want to make three very brief points because I'm here today to give you the, the view of the judges' uh, um, different judges obviously have different uh, points of emphasis but um, what, I, what I would like to convey to you is, is, is the general feeling of the judges on this very controversial issue. Um, I, th I think there are three main points I'd like to make by way of opening. The first is that um, in my view the abolition of the rule of corroboration uh, is a matter of constitutional importance. It's not simply a technical rule of the law of evidence that um, can be just changed as, uh, you know, as, as just part of a discussion of, of evidence. It, in my opinion, it's part of the constitution of this country and it, it is one of the great legal safeguards um, in, our, in our criminal justice system. That being so, I think that if you're contemplating making a change of such profound importance, it, it should be done uh, as part of a much wider uh, consideration of criminal evidence and not simply done in an ad hoc response to one particular decision of the Supreme Court, uh, which is the situation in which we find ourselves here. The second point I would make is that uh, there is a remarkable uh, degree of opposition to this uh, across the entire uh, legal profession. Um, and I'm not suggesting that that in itself is a, a conclusive consideration against the abolition of corroboration. Please don't misunderstand me on that. But what I, what I do say is that where you have such a degree of opposition across the entire profession, it should, I think, give us all pause for thought. Because these, uh, these are the views of people of considerable experience in the practical operation of the criminal justice system. And the third thing I would say is this, that throughout this controversy, the point has been made time and again that other countries uh, can do without the rule of corroboration and uh, why Scotland out of step? I think that's the wrong way to look at it. I think, uh, in fact, we should be very proud of the fact that we have something that other jurisdictions do not have. Um, it, it, is, it is one of the great hallmarks uh, of the Scottish criminal law. I take the view that we are all privileged in Scotland to live in what is a just society. And the reason for that is that our criminal system is rooted in the idea of fairness. And corroboration is, I, in my opinion, a critical element in that. Um, so I, I'm not here to apologize for the fact that we've got corroboration. I think we, we should all be very grateful that we do. Madam Chairman, that's, those are really the, 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 the three main points I'd like to make. It may be that in the course of, in, in the, course of the committee's questions, uh, I, I may be able to suggest uh, uh, other ways out of this problem, but that, 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 is, that is the general view of the, the judiciary. 
Um, in preparation for uh, the consultation response of the judges uh, to the, the Scottish Government's uh, consultation, uh, I asked every judge to express their view individually to me. And I have to tell you that, uh, with the exception of uh, my colleague, the Lord Justice Clark, all of the judges were opposed to the abolition of corroboration. I was just going to say, wow, that makes <laughs> um, Well, you've cheered me up, I can tell you, because um, and my position on abolishing corroboration is well recorded. Um, it might not be my colleague's position, but uh, I'll take questions now. Um, Elaine, followed by Margaret, followed by John. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, I appreciate what you're telling us about the, the, the views of the justiciary on this. However, you know, the views of organisations which support particularly sufferers of domestic abuse and sexual abuse seem to take a very different view. Uh, and they make the argument that uh, in the, if corroboration would, first of all, if corroboration were abolished, that there would be more prosecutions of domestic and sexual crimes. Uh, and also that, um, that the... Uh, verdict, I suppose, would rest on the, the quality of the evidence presented in court rather than the quantity of evidence in terms of the requirement for two pieces of independent evidence. I just wondered how you would respond to those particular points. Well, obviously, um, it, it is a, a matter of concern to ensure that sexual crime and domestic abuse is uh, properly and effectively prosecuted it is in the nature of that type of crime, or sorry, those types of crime, it's in the nature of those types of crime that uh, proof is difficult. Um, that is just a, a, a fact of life. And I think that what we should be very careful about is the risk that by legislating uh, in an attempt to cure one perceived problem in one corner of the criminal justice system, we in fact uh, make a reform, the consequences of which are completely unknowable um, across the whole uh, spectrum of the criminal justice system. So is there an alternative to this that would actually address the, the problems with domestic, domestic and sexual crimes? I mean, it's been suggested to me that you could maybe have a pilot where you abolish the, the need for corroboration and, uh, for those particular crimes and see, uh, to see how successful it was or whether, in fact, you can um, further amend what is considered to be corroboration to actually make it easier to prosecute those crimes. I, I think that that would not be a, a wise method of legislation because if you, if you legislate specifically for one particular type of offence and relax the evidential requirements in respect of that, then, in a sense, you create a privileged class uh, of complainers uh, in, in those particular types of crime, which I think has an unsettling effect on the rest of the, the, the criminal justice system. I think if you are going to legislate on this matter, it has to be legislation that applies across the board. And there is no further development of the of what is considered to be corroboration, which would actually help to address the problems of those types of crimes, is it? Well, you, you, you know, it's changed over the years. Is cor it's remarkable how corroboration has uh, strengthened in in my uh, time in the legal profession and on the bench, because um, when I was a, a young lawyer. Um, Corroboration very often came in the form of a fingerprint. You don't hear very much about fingerprints nowadays. And, and of course, the advances in DNA uh, have been quite extraordinary, uh, with the result that many crimes that 20 years ago would never have been uh, detected or certainly never prosecuted uh, can now be reopened and prosecuted successfully. Um, I, I mean, I realise, Ms Murray, that's not entirely an answer to the point you're making, but I, I, I mean, I do feel that uh, corroboration really works with deadly effect nowadays um, in, 
in the sort of cases I'm talking about. Thank you. Margaret, followed by Jordan, followed by Alison. Margaret. Good morning. Um, can I say just how much I appreciate your opening statement, uh, Lord Gill, because there has been a feeling that we're, you know, it's, it's a done deal, corroboration will be abolished, therefore look at the safeguards. And it's been a particular concern that um, perhaps a third way hasn't been looked at. A third way, I think, would be worthy of uh, exploration. That's retaining corroboration, but looking how we can improve the, the law of evidence. And, and while I, I know and have met with rape crisis and had very good um, um, conversations about their concerns, and I think a mutual agreement at some points, then people like adult survivors who have an experience of court have come up with, I think, some excellent suggestions on how that could be achieved. You've mentioned the progress in um, the quality of evidence, which should help, in, in theory, to make corroboration easier. They've mentioned the Muir of Doctrine, the fact that in practice in courts, there is a time limit very often placed on the use of that. If that was relaxed, that would help convictions in these interpersonal um, type um, crimes and, and charges. And um, also looking perhaps at um, more training for procurator fiscals to understand why, for example, it might take three days before a rape victim comes forward for the jury to understand that. Is this third way one that you think is worthy of looking at? I do. Um, I don't think it's wise to assume that if you abolish corroboration, you will increase the conviction rate. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really sceptical of this claim because what you are doing is, is giving the defence um, really a very powerful speech <laughs> because instead of having to face a corroborated case, uh, the defence can go to the jury and say, would you convict my client on the word of one person with nothing else to support it? It's a, it, it, it that, I think that could be a very powerful line to take with juries, and I'm not persuaded that this will lead... If, a, if corroboration is abolished, I'm not persuaded that it will increase the conviction rate. But to return to your main point, Ms Mitchell, if I may, uh, I think uh, that... We should not just, as it were, take one brick out of the wall and say, well, we'll change this. It's a rule of evidence. We, we can change that. What you've got to think about is the, the, the effects of it on the, over the whole system. Now, the system that we have today is really quite coherent and logical, and it consists of a whole series of checks and balances which attempt to achieve not just fairness towards the defence, but fairness towards the prosecution as well. The overriding principle in all our trials is that justice should be fairly dispensed. I think that if you are going to make a, or, or to consider a change of such profound importance, then it has to be looked at against a wider picture. And my suggestion would be um, that there should be an examination of, of all of the, the various safeguards in the criminal system, in the round. A reconsideration, for example, about the admissibility of certain statements, uh, a re-examination of the use that can be made of confessions, a re-examination of the, the right of the accused not to testify, um, uh, an, an examination of the right of the accused to withhold his defence at the earliest stage of a prosecution and, uh, and so on. The, these are all the various uh, sort of tensions within the system which I think the problem has to be looked at in that context. Um, now, the, 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 at the moment, I think... Uh, the legislative record of, the, of this parliament uh, over the last few years has shown that um, there is an, open, an openness to change uh, and an open-mindedness that, you know, we, we should be looking at it in that wider context in, in order to reach 
what is the wisest outcome? Uh, rather than just, I think we're looking at this in much too narrow a context. I me, and convener. I think there's also concern. This this committee is particularly under pressure. We've, we've got lots of legislation. This is the second time we've met this week and the second time in, in recent weeks we've met. And there is a concern that we're not giving these important issues the time that we would ideally like to. In view of that, would there also be an argument, as well as looking at this third way, retaining and trying to improve and looking at all the very complicated issues, including the rights of an accused, um, which is paramount, as well as the, the defence evidence, for taking this whole issue um, out of the bill and properly considering it with some kind of um, body looking at it in depth. Do you think that would be a sensible way forward? I think that, that was what I would, uh, I would suggest myself. Um, in, in the past, um, you know, the government's appointed royal commissions on these sort of things, or, all this, or they appointed departmental committees or so on. And, and I think that something like that it, it, it would be a very, a very good way out of our difficulty here. Um, because then I feel that a, a balanced judgment could be reached um, by looking at all of these various facets and the way in which they, in which they interact. Very helpful. I don't think it would necessarily take a lot of time and I don't think it would cause it a great deal of delay. Um, we, we have a very knowledgeable uh, public in Scotland and we have a knowledgeable profession and we have academic support from the law schools. Um, the, the issues are pr pretty well known um, and it should be possible, I think, to come to a wise uh, conclusion by, by looking at it overall. I think that would delay some fears that perhaps by putting it into commission it's knocking it back. That certainly doesn't have to be mm. the case. Mm -hmm. no, um, a commission so. could deal with it, as you say, and the, yeah. the issues are, are well known. I mean, I don't think this would be a way of avoiding the problem. I think it would be a positive way of a tackling get, getting a better outcome. Thank you very much. Can I ask, you said it wouldn't be um, necessarily be a very long time. Can you give me some idea of a time scale if one were to... I don't really know about that. Right. But, uh, but I, I, don't, I don't imagine it would be in a matter of years if that's what, that's that's the what thing you're I was worried about. Of, yes. No, I don't think so. I, I've got others coming. I just want, because you, you've opened up the issues of you know, looking at all the ways evidence is, is used in court just now, I, I, one of my concerns, and I don't know, you may not know the answer, is there's been any... Um, inquiry into why juries um, do not convict. Academic research into why juries, maybe when the Crown thinks they've got a terrific case, the jury doesn't convict, and into how juries think about things, not, notwithstanding we'll keep the anonymity of, uh, but an academic research into it. Because I think that's another issue that we that, sort of tend bit, to not look at. That's a big question, Madam Convener, because um, the the restrictions on one's access to the views of juries are so are so uh, tight that it's n never been possible, I think, for proper academic research to be done into the the ways in which juries uh, come to their verdicts. Um, you can't interview jurors, I'm afraid. Should there be some academic well, research that does anonymise, but that looks at issues? I mean, it does seem to me that sometimes we get, you know, perverse decisions. Um, and it's not really to blame jurors. It's just why, why is it that with the evidence that's presented, mm -hmm. this is another part of the, um, the, the, the whole drama, as it were, of the court, that we don't know what, why it comes to that view. Well, it, I have to say it's not a subject that I've really got any sort of developed views on. I haven't, I haven't really gone into that in my own mind in any great detail. But my experience has been that, uh, by, by and large, juries get it right. Yep. That's that one answer. Um, John, followed by Alison, followed by Sandra, please. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Good morning, Lord Gill. Um, I, like my colleagues, was very reassured from what I heard from you. And I have three points that I could put to you, Lord Gill, please. And it's things we've heard in evidence <clears throat> and aware of the terms of reference that Lord Calloway had. It's been suggested to us both in written and verbally that the proposal to abolish corroboration is a rebalancing act. Could you comment on that at all, please? I, I think I, I, I put the matter more strongly than that. <laughs> 
I mean, right. I, I think you've got to think very carefully about what, what the consequences of this could be. It, it, it's not just a rebalancing act at all. It's uh, a major change uh, which has consequences that many of which are unknowable at this stage. And it's not just a piece of law reform in, in the narrow area of the law of evidence. This uh, affects the whole uh, approach of our society towards justice and it could have consequences that could be very, very serious. By and large, <coughs> we, we, we do not have many miscarriages of justice in Scotland and uh, when they are discovered, we put them right. But there are, there are very few. Um, my fear would be that there would be many more if, if corroboration were abolished. Thank you for that. A further point we've received uh, um, from a number of sources that and you touched on briefly yourself is that with advances in DNA, with CCTV, indeed with other covert surveillance, that there's an argument to be made there's um, less, uh, you know, there's more corroboration available rather than... Yeah, well, there is, I think. The, the risk, though, is that um, if the prosecution don't need corroboration. Uh, in some cases, they may take the view, well, why go looking for it? We've got, we've got the complainer, and the complainer's word uh, may be good enough. Um, my other worry, of course, would be that sometimes going looking for corroboration is, is costly in terms of police time and resources. And when you are dealing with scarce resources, uh, it would be unfortunate if economies were made in that direction, if evidence, if corroboration was available. And one last point, if I may, on this. Um, just imagine that you have a prosecution brought uh, without corroboration. If the defence can show that corroboration might have been available, then, of course, that is another very powerful defence point. Thank you very much. That's the points are covered. Thank you very much. Uh, Alison, followed by Sandra, please. Thank you. Well, I, I too welcome your, your, your comments. I'm very concerned by this profound change, and I've been calling for a Royal Commission for, for some time. Um, I want to just um, pursue the, the likelihood of wrongful convictions um, a, bit, a bit further, really, and fears that you've expressed. Um, if we take them with other reforms that, that have been galloping through our system at the moment, like changes to double jeopardy and the proposals on the admissibility of evidence of bad character and previous convictions, and do you think that these uh, accumulated kind of changes uh, bring great risks? That, that, that's my point. Uh, that corroboration has to be seen in that much wider context. And if you're going to consider a, a change of this importance, then those are exactly the other considerations that have all got to be t taken into consideration. OK, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, we, we know that in England and Wales um, they have a whole lot of other checks and balances that we don't have. Um, and I, I, I'm not sure how useful it is to get into saying, well, we'd be a little bit better if we had this instead of that, because I think your position is we really ought to set this aside and look at it in the round. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Are you referring to jury size? Are you alluding to yes. jury size? Yeah. And, um, the three verdicts, I think, which nobody's... Is that your, the position? We should be looking at all of that or not? Or I, I think if, if, if you say, well, uh, be, be in view of, of the abolition of corroboration, we'll um, change the majority from the necessary 8-7 to 10-5 or whatever. The moment you say that, you're actually conceding that by abolishing corroboration, you're creating a greater risk of a miscarriage of justice. And the fact that the, you, you then bring this safeguard in is, I think, an acknowledgement that by abolishing corroboration, um, you know, there is a greater risk of things going wrong. 
Should it also involve the, the three verdicts, bringing in the not voting? Yes, the that, whole thing? That, that could usefully be looked at too yeah. as, uh, as part of the whole general survey of the, 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 the criminal law. Sandra. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. <clears throat> you, you did mention about the fact that you know, you're looking at corroboration and we're looking at the uh, criminal justice bill on the, in the round and it has been touched upon about jury changes and you know, double jeopardy and changes in, in various other parts of the law. So what you're basically saying is, in the Justice Committee, we should go ahead with the criminal justice bill, but corroboration should be taken out and looked as a separate entity. I think that would be a very wise course. Chair, can I just <clears throat> follow on? I just wanted to clarify that point. Um, basically, following on from what John Finney had mentioned, you mentioned yourself about the advances in corroborative evidence such as DNA, etc. And obviously you said there were more corroboration available. And you did also say, and I think I quote you in some parts of this, was that uh, if there's more corroboration available and you have a other witness, as you might say, you did say, why go looking for it? Now, I was quite you know, concerned about that remark because obviously you've mentioned about the judges, the, the overall majority of judges are in favour of not abolishing corroboration. But we're also talking about victims here, not just the judicial system, yeah. who don't get justice in certain aspects, whether it be domestic violence, rape, also older people, children in children's homes, where there's not a corroborative person. Now, if there is other corroborative evidence there without a other person, why wouldn't you go looking for it? You did say, yeah. why go looking for it? No, no. no. No, forgive me. I, 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 I think that's not what Lord Gill actually I, I, was saying. I, I, I'll let you. I don't, I don't, no, I don't exactly think I said Lord that. Said. No, I'd just like him to clarify no. that point. I'm, I'm sorry if I haven't expressed myself right. clearly enough, but um, I, I, I'm as concerned as anyone uh, if, if uh, a crime of a sexual nature or a crime against a child or a domestic abuse uh, goes unprosecuted and unpunished and because plainly that is a matter of obvious concern. But what you've got to be very careful about is that uh, in, in attempting to provide a solution to that, you, you make a reform that uh, it spreads across the entire uh, criminal justice system. Because it wouldn't just, uh, abolishing corroboration wouldn't just um, apply in the cases that, 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 you, that you've mentioned. It would apply in every criminal case, and it would apply, for example, if any of us were to be involved in a, an accidental misunderstanding in a shop, and uh, the shop uh, assistant said, I saw you uh, p picking up something and putting it in but your... you were saying that! <laughs> And, and if any of us found ourselves in that kind of situation, I think then we would begin to see the value of the law of corroboration. You know, it, 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 it applies very widely. Can I just come in on, on the point that I was making? Yes. You haven't quite explained the point I was making. Maybe I've picked you up wrong, but you certainly did say, not you who I go looking for it, but the defence would say, if we have corroboration, i.e. as a other person, there may be other evidence there, but why go looking for it? Yeah. The point I'm trying to make is corroboration, DNA, video cameras, as has been said by Mr Finney, and other forms of corroborative evidence. If that is a, take the instance of a shop that you're, you're mentioning, most of them have CCT cameras, that would corroborate of evidence where the crime had been committed. But I don't particularly want to go down the road of somebody being accused of taking something from a shop. Uh, what I'm trying to say is, is justice served? because defence lawyers, if they have another person, don't bother going looking for other corroborative evidence. No, I was really thinking more about the case where the prosecutor who has to make the decision whether or not to bring a prosecution, uh, if he has uh, the word of one witness, um, he may then say, well, that, that's enough. We can we can go ahead with this prosecution, and thereby uh, n n fail to follow up other other 
lines of corroboration, which I think would then present the defence with quite a good uh, defence argument that you, you had the evidence there if you'd only gone yeah. looking for it, but you didn't bother. Mm -hmm. that, I, that, that, I'm sorry, yeah, that was really the, the only angle. point I wanted to make. Following, just sort of on from Thank that, because one of the things that I get myself into trouble here, but here goes. One of the things I heard the Cabinet Secretary say, and I've heard it said before on behalf of rape crisis and women's aid, is it's not about securing more prosecutions. It's about access to justice. And I don't know what that means. And I wondered if you'd like to comment on that, because I had thought that the whole purpose of putting this into the legislation was to secure more prosecutions. That apparently is not the case now. It's about securing access to justice. Now, I remember hearing that clearly on a television interview, and I've heard it subsequently, and I don't know what that means. I wonder if you'd care to comment. Well, I think the only, the only rational uh, justification for this proposal must surely be to increase the rate of convictions. <laughs> it must be. What, what, what other reason could there be? Well, I'm agreeing with you. I'm just <laughs> allowing you to, to corroborate what I think yeah. about it. But I just found it quite an extraordinary statement, as I thought that was the, yeah. the driving force, even if we narrow it uh, to sexual and rape offences, although, of course, it applies across mm. the piece. Yes. Um, Alison. That's just following on from that, because of course we know that rape convictions in other jurisdictions are still very low and are not um, improved by, by not having corroboration. So there are other forces at work which stop either juries or, 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 or people coming, coming to conclusions about things like that. Um, I think there's a real danger that we're moving from um, prosecuting in the public interest to prosecuting in the victim's interest. And I, I wonder if what the Cabinet Secretary is moving towards is that the victim should have their day in court. How would you respond to that? That is not the basis on which our prosecution system works. Of course not. Uh, our prosecution system works on the basis that the Lord Advocate makes the decision in the public interest as he sees it, whether or not a case is to be prosecuted. And it's a marvellous uh, feature of, of our criminal justice system. The privileged position of the Lord Advocate as the head of the prosecution system is really one of the things that makes it s so fair. He makes an independent, unbiased decision by looking at the case and deciding if it's in the public interest to do it. And if he says he's not going to prosecute the case, no one can gain say that decision. And it's not for the complainer to say, I want, yeah. I want the case prosecuted. Yeah. 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 Well, Thank helpful. you. Could, could I also ask um, whether... Could, I like, uh, could you just let Christian yeah. and John... I'll let yes, Christian and then I'll let you back <laughs> in. Okay. And then John Finney and... Are you, are you on my list? You, you are now on my list, yes. Yeah, okay. So Christian I'll then, better. Roderick... Good morning, Lord Yale. And, um, I've, I've looked at this papers and this uh, evidence uh, from a, a different background because, of course, it's my, only my second meeting at the Justice Committee. But uh, after hearing what I heard this morning, I would like maybe you to develop a little bit more on the problem of access to justice. You did say at one point at the start that there were a problem in the judicial system and there would be some, we should uh, um, somehow uh, find solution to, to, to change it. And uh, will the access to justice, will uh, removing uh, corroborations, would improve or will not improve the access to justice in your view, saying that it would be more about the quality of evidence than the quantity of evidence? I, I don't think that uh, this will improve the quality of justice uh, in Scotland in any way. I, I think... Uh, there's a very serious risk that there'll be even fewer convictions um, for reasons I've already given. And I also think that um, if, you, if you make this change in isolation without looking at the wider picture, you may find that there are consequences that at the moment are unknowable that could be very adverse to the system. 
So you, sorry, do you think you think that we should not start by removing corroboration? No, we start I, with something I, else. I think you're starting it. in exactly the wrong place. But regarding the access to justice, do you think, Lord Gill, that uh, it will it would increase the number of cases uh, to be brought to prosecution no. or not? No, definitely not. It, it might increase the number of prosecutions. I'm, I'm certainly convinced it would increase the number of convictions. I've now got Roderick. Sorry, I apologise, Mr. Previously. Um, thank you, Convener. First of all, can I refer to my register of interest as a member of the Faculty of Advocates? Um, Lord Gill, morning. I've uh, kind of, uh, listened very carefully to what you've said, and uh, to some degree that's preempted a line of questioning that I was going to embark on. Um, to be fair to Lord um, Carloway, however, um, when he gave evidence on the 24th of September at uh, questioning from me, he basically uh, accepted that there was not necessarily the case uh, under the new proposals and the new prosecutorial test that there would be more prosecutions. So I don't think one, one necessarily needs to be too harsh on what Lord Carnaway has actually suggested. Um, I'll take your points on what the purpose of the change would be if there are other, not more prosecutions or certainly not more, more convictions uh, uh, and take that on board. Uh, if we can just speculate for a moment, however, I've taken on board everything you've said so far, but um, the Scottish Human Rights Commission regard corroboration as performing a quality control function. Um, what other quality control functions do you see in the system at the present time? And, uh, and in a different system which wasn't relying on corroboration, what kind of quality control functions would you like to see? I, I don't know. Uh, but I'm pretty certain that, that changing the majority uh, rule is, it isn't, isn't the answer. Um, I think it's illogical, actually. If, if there is a good, solid intellectual case for abolishing corroboration, then there should be no need for any safeguards. The moment, the moment you say there have to be safeguards, then I think immediately you're conceding that um, it, it is going to create a risk of miscarriage of justice, which, in my view, it will. And in terms of uh, kind of things that, are, that happen in England, like... Uh, Section 78 of the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, going to statutory discretion to exclude evidence. I'm sorry, I'm not hearing you. I beg your pardon. In terms of uh, provisions such as they have in England, statutory discretion to exclude evidence, do you think that uh, that sh should uh, be considered in Scotland, or are you happy with common law powers? No. Um, I, I'd, I'd, I'd like to make it clear that I am not here to suggest that the status quo in Scottish criminal law should be uh, preserved, as it were, immutable and unchangeable. Every legal system has to constantly renew itself because it has to adapt to changing needs and changing circumstances. And so therefore, it is perfectly right and proper that the Parliament should reconsider the question of corroboration, among many other questions in the criminal law. I'm not suggesting for a moment that the subject is off limits for discussion. Far from it. We can all benefit from looking again at all of our most comfortable assumptions and examining them to see if, they, if they're still valid in modern conditions. But, <laughs> but what one ought not to do, I think, is to simply take, in an ad hoc response to one decision of the Supreme Court, just say, oh, well, we, we, we can change this particular rule of evidence. I, I just don't think that's the path of wisdom. So, so basically, in a nutshell, looking at kind of other things in isolation is the wrong way to look at it. Is, is that your view? Yeah. No, yeah. There are other rights of the accused, yeah. you know, that could usefully be looked at. Um, for example, the fact that the accused can, uh, as it were, withhold his defence until a fairly late stage in a prosecution, that, that is a point that could usefully be re-examined. And, and, of course, a whole vexed question of the use of statements and so on, that, that again, has been a constant uh, source of trouble in the courts. Um, but the, the, all, all of this can be seen as, as, as 
part of one general problem, which is just to keep the law just and fair and keep it up to date. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're pretty well, I mean, we've got supplementaries, but I think pretty well we've established the position. I don't want to have Lord Gill repeating himself over and over again on issues. If we've got something new to bring, John, have you? It, it, it's yes. I think oh, it is. You. Convener, thanks. Um, we will see. <laughs> we, we will, and um, convener, I'm sure you'll keep me right. Um, Lord Gill, we're, we're to hear from the Lord Advocate next, and um, in, in advance of that, we've been given supplementary written evidence from the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. And if I read this passage to you, um, please, I would appreciate your comment. It's important to be clear at the outset that the abolition of the requirement for corroboration is not about improving detection or conviction rate. It is about improving access to justice for victims. The passage then goes on to cite a, a Supreme Court of Canada um, ruling of, from 1954, which says, and I quote, it cannot be overemphasized that the purpose of a criminal prosecution is not to obtain a conviction. It is to lay before the jury what the Crown considers to be credible evidence relevant to what is alleged to be a crime. Are there frailties in that approach? I would. I think that... Uh, <laughs> I think that, uh, that... That is rather a simplistic statement that is being made by the Crown. Um, th what is the point in bringing a prosecution unless there is a reasonable prospect that it will succeed? Surely the criterion in which prosecutions are brought is that it's in the public interest that a person should be prosecuted in order to be convicted and punished uh, for, for the crime that has been committed. Um, I, if, if, if it's simply to give access to justice, then that is not my understanding of the, the role of the Lord Advocate. But I may be wrong, of course. And it, it clearly wouldn't be justice for the accused to be taken there in that premise? Well, if you have a case that's unlikely to succeed, I'm, I'm not convinced that you're doing the complainer any favours by bringing it. Any thanks? I mean, it is an court, ordeal, court is for, not it's a an ordeal for, for a For complainer. anyone, I wouldn't have thought. Um, Alison? I think Lord Gill's um, counsel has been very wise this morning. I think he's yes, I think we really, unless John, you've, got, you've not had the opportunity to ask, so please. It's just a kind of supplementary. On, yes, please. And then we'll, I think we really clearly know the position now. Thank you very much. But John, yeah. if you... Uh, it was just along the lines, and I think, sorry, Lord Gill, your opening marks did certainly raise the bar a bit uh, with regards to the, 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 the contention that's associated with this bill. And I know you also did say that one should not assume, but if we are... Should the government get their way that they are satisfied that the proposals provide sufficient checks and balances to protect witnesses and combative culture of inner courts and the rights of the accused? Because so far, I think, you know, I have heard the comment come from more or less the, uh, the professional bodies and agencies and not so much about the witnesses. So if, you know, the, the, the bill does get the go-ahead, what, what, uh, do you see any pitfalls or downfalls or... If they should appear in court, what protection do you think the protections that are within the bill is there uh, is required? I think the uh, if if you alter the rule about the majorities, that, that certainly is a exercise in damage limitation. I mean, it will it will perhaps do some good, but um, um, I, I just my my feeling is that uh, this hasn't been fully thought through, and there could be some very, very adverse consequences. Yeah. <laughs> My breath's taking you away. I mean, at least uh, I'm going to... I know, I think, I think Lord Gill's position is absolutely, you know, underlined, double yeah. underlined, and words like damage limitation. I think you can ask for any more. Um, do you wish to add anything further to the end of... I, I, I'd like, if I may, just leave you with this thought that this whole uh, controversy that has, has, has resulted from uh, Lord Carloway's review has actually served quite a useful purpose because it has brought out into the open a great many things that over the years we've just taken for granted. And it's always useful to re-examine your assumptions um, and see if they're, they're keeping up to date with, the, with a very fast-changing world. Um, I think it has been a useful uh, exercise, but 
what I think it all points to is that it, what's needed is a is a, a, a wider and more general exercise uh, in re-examination of all the checks and balances that apply. What I would say to you is this, though, that the rule of corroboration is not some sort of archaic uh, legal relic from antiquity. Um, we didn't get where we are by accident. The fact that we have this rule in our, in our law which I regard as one of its finest features, uh, it is a, a result of centuries of legal development and legal thought and the views of the legal writers, of politicians, practitioners, down through the ages. And it has been found to be a good rule. And I would say, listen to the wisdom of the ages. Um, it has a lot to tell us. Thank you very much, Lord Gill. And um, I'm going to suspend for, I'll give you 10 minutes um, because we've got the Lord Advocate to, to follow. Thank you very much. <laughs>